Today on Crooked Mustache, we have this, the Mustang Mach-E GT, the competitor to the Model Y, and some would say the better version. Stay tuned. Now I've borrowed this Mach-E from a viewer here in South Florida who reached out to me and said, I think this is gonna be the fastest thing you'll test drive for a while. So who was I to pass that up? Now, when it was first introduced, no, better yet, when it was first announced, the internet was in uproar because they labeled this thing a Mustang. Now, remember, Ford has had some issues with the whole Mustang naming culture every time they tried to replace it. They tried with the Probe, which ended up becoming its own car. So why name it a Mustang? Why not just name it something else? Cast yourself back a couple years when Ford decided, or better yet, someone stared into a crystal ball and looked ahead and said, hey, I think we should stop selling cars and focus. Get it? focus, because they stopped selling it, we should stop selling cars and focus on trucks, crossovers, and SUVs. Here you go. Now, for the introduction of an electric car, this was actually kind of perfect when you consider the fact that if you look at everything else in this segment, Jaguar's I-Pace, the Kia EV6, the Ionic 5, the Model Y, they all kind of share the same body lines, and that's because this body line works. This is exactly what the average person wants, frighteningly. So Ford decided, you know what, we've got two feet, we'll keep selling the Mustang and we'll focus on our division, which is selling the most because nobody was buying Focuses, nobody was buying Fusions and no one was buying Tauruses. That leaves this and the Mustang is the only other car you can buy from Ford. So it would seem then that the solution was with the Mustang Mach-E, well, let's just, I'm gonna refer to it as the Mach-E from now on. So the solution would seem as with the Mach-E, it was meant to fill a gap. With Ford not selling as many cars as they needed to to justify continuing to produce them, they decided, let's find something that we know is gonna sell as EVs are on the uptick. So that's where this thing came into being. There's just no getting around this thing. So the first thing you'll probably notice when you sit in the Mach-E is this giant 15 and a half inch display. Now, one of the things right off the bat that caught my attention and I really like, everything from here up is what changes. Ford intelligently thought ahead and actually separated the bottom part for your AC controls and they're always there, which means they're always easily accessible. For example, here in the AC, you can actually change manually by touching here, since this isn't a traditional system, or you can actually raise and lower the air conditioning that way. So the rest of, every, the rest of your menu is actually all of your settings. You've got Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, now, one of the things that I feel separates the Mach-E from other EVs is that they didn't just stick everything into a sensor display. You actually get a small screen of, an, ahead of you in front of the steering wheel, which acts as a traditional instrument cluster. For example, battery is displayed, how many miles of range, and it gives you some basic compass information as well as your total mileage that's on the odometer in any car. I really like that because one of the things I've always had a hard time with is these vehicles that have sensor displays, the Mini comes to mind when I first drove the, the new Mini when it was launched in the early 2000s. It didn't make sense that the Speedo was in the middle. And then I can think of cars as the Saturn Ion where the entire instrument cluster was set off to the side. Moving on, tons of menus in here. And of course, there's all of the different vehicle settings you can go into. Moving down below, you've actually got a wireless charger, which I have checked and works pretty seamlessly. There we go. Here, unfortunately, my bottle does not fit uh, my, my big 32 ounce bottle. So these are smaller cup holders. One of the things I like is that even though they have put the tablet right in the middle, they've actually done a nice design here with the AC vent, which makes it all feel very symmetrical without being too sterile is the word I'm thinking of. I like the material choice. It is still a lot of plastics, but when you take into account that these days there are gonna be a lot of hard materials, I'd rather the plastics than some of the soft touch coatings, for example, of BMW, Audi, Volkswagen. Those tend to wear off after some time. Now, while there is plenty of room here up front, it does feel a little bit odd. Most cars these days seem to have a door line, which tends to sit around your shoulder. And in this, you actually sit much higher, giving you a much better view. And in this vehicle, it does seem, with the exception of the C pillars, much like the Camaro suffers from having a large C pillar, this one seems to as well, although it's not as bad. Now, one of the things I can mention is while all, both of these front seats are height adjustable, this is actually as low as it goes. I'm all the way down. And it's not because of headroom that I'm worried. It's just because it feels like I'm sitting quite up high, even though I'm not. Now, in terms of connectivity, when it comes to charging your devices, you have a few options. 
you've got the wireless charger, you've also got a USB-C port as well as USB-A, which is nice to have. A lot of vehicles now are opting for only USB-C ports and I do feel like there's still a lot of people that are gonna have most power bricks that are USB-A compatible and may not have Type-C cables. So it may be a function of people having to transition to having all Type-C compatible uh, charging cables to be able to use them. So it's nice that this one still offers a USB-A connectivity. You could always connect your phone wirelessly via Bluetooth or through the CarPlay or Android Auto. In terms of storage, it's not huge, but you do have a few places, the small cubby hole here where that has the integrated wireless charger and a little hideaway hole here that is actually under the adjustable armrest. So I really like this open and almost floating console and and this little cargo tray with the built-in charger. There is an additional small cubby hole down here, not quite as big as the one we saw in the Toyota Sienna, but then again, that's a minivan and this is a crossover. This isn't big enough that a purse would fit, maybe a small case of some kind that contains something that has to stay inside of a case, for example, would fit there quite comfortably. Now, the seats are very interesting. They are a combo of suede and leather. One of the things worth mentioning is that they've actually gone for the leather in the places where the seat is most likely to see the most traffic. If you look at a car, for example, that gets driven every day, you'll typically see the most wear here on the side bolstering and also here where the driver actually gets in and out. So it's nice that they've actually decided to make that leather and leave the center a suede, which gives the car a nice contrast on its seats. Another thing that's cool is you'll see up here the shoulder bolstering, which really makes you feel nice and cocooned add this to the seat belt and this cockpit really starts to feel very very accommodating and very very safe i can say that it definitely held me in place when i took off because this thing was insane now let's talk about the back seat which actually does look pretty roomy here we are in the back i did have to move the seat up slightly just to ensure that i would actually fit but once you're in I've got a few inches of headroom. It's actually really roomy back here. It does feel a little bit weird not having a cover over the glass roof. I'm not sure how that would feel on a really sunny day. I do know that not having the cover means that the roof line can be slightly higher since you don't have to have any of the mechanicals in place to actually retract the slide. This is kind of nice. It's very, it does give the feeling of something which they're probably never gonna produce, which is the Mach-E convertible. But I do think that this fills that nice gap of not being able to actually take the roof off. Now also worth mentioning is that this does have little indicators to tell you where the child safety restraints are. And much like Toyota does a really good job of hiding them, they've actually got this leather pad with cutouts that tells you exactly where they are, which it's, it's really helpful, especially when you're trying to get a car seat in here. So there is no pass through through the actual seat itself, but you do get the fold down armrest and all three passengers get not only a full three point belt, which is actually integrated into the seat rather than in the ceiling, keeping everything nice and tidy. Each passenger gets an actual dedicated headrest, which is important for safety. Aside from that, each passenger does get a cubby hole, though I wouldn't call it a cup holder. That's gonna be the one in the armrest. And you do have your own weird electronically all right so the door actually the door actuates electronically which is actually pretty interesting so behind you you've got the 60 40 folding rear seats and now we can move on to the cargo area now on to the cargo area where this thing actually does its best basically to be the perfect hot hatch so inside with the seats up, you've got 29 cubic feet, which doesn't seem like a lot, but thanks to this flexible tonneau cover rather than a hard shell, it just sort of expands without putting down the rear seats, which means that you can carry pretty much right up to the windshield if need be. But if you do need additional space, you can fold down the second row. Second row. You can fold down the second row to get an additional 20 cubic feet, bringing everything to 60, which is about the size of your average small SUV, albeit, with only two passengers in the car. And it is nice that it moves because I feel like these are the first things that tend to get broken. When somebody actually has a car for a long period of time, this gets pulled on, somebody puts something in here that's too big and boom, it's gone. So under here, unlike other cars, you do have some sort of storage. It isn't huge, so I, don't, I wouldn't really consider this additional storage. Although if you do have something that's just that much higher, you could take out the spare tire kit. 
and remove this, which would allow you to carry just a little bit more. So while we're back here, you've also got some security latches to basically secure any cargo that do a nice job of hiding away. And you can see the actual tethers for car seats. Should you need to power something outside the car here in the back, you've got a 12 volt power port that can easily take care of anything. It's pretty much hatchback size, which is not an insult to say for something this large. And of course, you've got a power release, which will actually bring the tailgate down and take care of everything. Now, one of the biggest things I noticed right off the bat with the performance packs, well, the performance pack was obviously the wheels. This is the four wheel drive model, which does mean a ton of power. And as I mentioned, I've already actually driven it and it is not lacking in the performance department. So from the outside, it's not a Mustang. This isn't right. Is what I would say if I was a complete lunatic because this thing looks awesome. This is, like it or not, this is the shape that's coming for the future. Everything that is EV, the I-Pace, the Ionic 5, the EV6, uh, the ID4, they all share this similar shape. The Model Y and the Model X. The Model Y is basically the Model X put through a copy machine at 75%. This is the shape that's coming because this is the one that is the most usable. I personally, being a car guy that I am, would love it if Ford would take this exact platform and ramrod it into the body of a traditional Mustang. It just wouldn't work. I guess maybe it would, given the fact that they've actually already built the concept with a six-speed manual transmission, so Lord knows exactly what that thing's capable of. While we're on the subject of this, there's a few things we need to point out. The cool thing with the Mustang, and I think what sets it apart from other EVs, is the Mustang already looks like a more human car which is what car design has always been. Car cars are meant to look gripping and to excite us. And when I see this thing and actually driving here, I passed by a Model Y and the guy was crazy. He's like, dude, I love your car. It's one of those things that I just, I, I'll never understand. Granted, this is suffering from the limitation of not having the Tesla network as everything that is not a Tesla suffers that limitation. So pretty much you have to just accept that Teslas are the iPhone and these are the Androids this is probably gonna be one of the better ones that you can pick. Now, as we go around here to the back, you can see that even though it's a taller crossover, it still hides this massive body line very well. Now, this is the glass roof. And if you notice, this black bodywork is bodywork. It's separate from the white part, and this allows a couple of extra inches of headroom for the front and mostly for the rear passengers while it's hidden by this spoiler. Actually reminds me of the Porsche Panamera Gran Turismo that actually hides the fact that it's a wagon really, really well, unless you have it parked side by side next to the sedan. And that's what this car does. They really slope the back. It's, it's not a Mustang, but it's what a Mustang would be if it was designed as an EV and as a crossover today. That's something you have to accept. And if you don't believe that it's a Mustang, let's take a look at the front end because that is clearly where this thing sets itself apart. Now, it may not seem like a big deal. It may seem like just, an, just some layer of pantomime, but this right here, this is what separates the Mustang from all other EVs. This makes it look like it still has a grill, like there's still a fire breathing or air sucking engine underneath, which it doesn't have. And believe it or not, I like this. Just like, there's a, just like there's a faux grill here to let you know that this thing is still a traditional car. Unlike some of the other EVs, which basically go, well, since there's no engine here, we'll just cover this over and just mold it into one piece of bumper. I like the fact that this still looks like a traditional car. Some people might even see it and just forget that it's an EV at all. And then you're just a normal person driving your car. So while we're up here, let's talk about the frunk, which does have some limitations and does seem kind of weird. It's one of those really, really oddball uh, features. So the only way to open the frunk, and this doesn't make sense, is down here. You have to pull the latch twice, and it's only at that point that you can open the frunk, which if this was a real Mustang is where you'd expect to see a V8 engine. You get the point that this is truly an EV, and there's plenty of space up here. There's actually enough space, shockingly, that maybe you could hide a child in here. Maybe you could hide a child in here. Maybe you could hide a child in here. Hide a child in here. Yeah, sure, my car seats six people, three inside, one in the passenger seat, and one up front. A lot of space up here in the front, actually much more than I would have expected, considering that this is not the primary mode of storage. Also, while you're up here, this is where you would actually top off your windshield wiper fluid, which is one of the few things you actually have to worry about topping off in terms of liquids. 
Also worth mentioning here is the child release. Because this trunk is beyond a certain size and does latch from the outside, legally they had to include an actual safety latch which allows a child, they could actually open the trunk from inside. And that's the release that would open the trunk. And then closing it, the frunk I should say. Very simple. Still on the outside, rather than adding a slim, futuristic-like door handle that's reminiscent of what you'd find in a Mazda Miata, Ford actually just added a small pull here, which uses a push button to open the car. And also here you've got Ford's integrated keypad, which they've had since the 90s, and it works. This is a way for you to lock your keys in the car so that you can actually access the vehicle, let's say if you're going to the beach or a place where you can't carry your key with you, this is an option you have. Also, I can't get over these wheels on the performance pack. These 20 inch wheels really do set it apart and they go, they play nice off of the pearl white. It is a pretty nice car. I think it's time we should drive it. All right, so first thing, I'm trying to do the EV thing. So the owner of this has it in the one pedal mode. So it is taking a little bit of getting used to, like a lot, like I forgot to put it in drive, kind of getting used to. I've heard people tell me that once they switch to an EV and they have this one pedal thing, it's really weird to switch back to a regular car. A normal car, one, it creeps forward. A normal gas car creeps forward uh, when you take your foot off the brake. So here we go. I'm not even sure what mode the car is in right now, but. Wow! <laughs> I'm driving something with. Oh, I, I can't even put words together. So I'm driving something that, uh, if I remember correctly, this is not only the GT, but it's also the performance pack version of the GT. So this is the fastest version you can get. This sacrifices a little bit of battery range for more power and uh, a, a different uh, programming set for the motors to ensure that you get as much acceleration possible. This is probably the fastest car I'll review for some time, simply because it's, it's an EV, which is kind of a cheat. Overall, I can tell you right now, it drives really great. The suspension is informative. It's not a luxury car. It's not a Rolls Royce. I'm gonna, I specifically aimed for a road reflector and I didn't feel it. So other benefits, it's super quiet. It's, it's ridiculously quiet in here. To quote Jeremy, that is intoxicating to feel that kind of acceleration, you, you'd have to be in something with a, approaching 700 horsepower. The, uh, the Audi TTRS comes to mind as something that is like not outrageously expensive, but is still quick, but it's not gonna be that quick from every speed. It'll be that quick from a dead stop or the perfect gear. Honestly, I see why people switch to electric cars, like wow. And so that's the Mustang Mach-E GT performance pack. They probably called it the GTP at this point, but that's a reference to another racing series. This is incredible. If you're in the market for an EV, I'm not saying this is the cheapest one on the planet, but it's definitely the reason why Ford has opted to stop selling cars. This is where the market is going. And in terms of a performance vehicle, this thing rivals most supercars in terms of acceleration, unless you get into hypercars. And this is an EV, something that you get money back from the government just for buying, and it's treated as an eco-friendly vehicle wherever you go, even though it has acceleration to rip your face off. I don't know what else to say other than this has been awesome. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of our upcoming future videos. I'm Alfred for Crooked Mustache. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Dale.